And I'm really, really excited for you guys to have this talk with uh, the team of talk. And so I'll, let me tell you a bit about Eli. She's, uh, or they are a cyber, a researcher and cyber anthropologist. And they'll explain that a bit later. And they're at the intersection of uh, tech, design, and ethics. Um, Ellie believes in our techno future has arrived. And here's questions need to be asked so we can discuss some comfortable answers. Um, and this year, Eli completed their master's degree in data analytics and computational social science at the University of Massachusetts Armist with a focus on technology, policy, and techno literacy. Um, and so if you're interested in continuing conversations or if you want to get her talking, ask her about uh, uh, sentiment analysis and a technological other, which sounds really cool and mysterious. Um, so yeah, without further ado, I'll hand it off to Ellie. Wonderful. Fantastic. So hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Eli. You can also call me Ellie. Both are genuinely okay. Uh, I'm a cyborg anthropologist, which means I get to study at the intersection of human, non-human, computer interaction, and culture. It's really awesome, and I've enjoyed getting to research in this area. Now, why am I interested in this topic? My research in my master's degree talked about what it means to be a human, and that brings up a lot of questions of, does that include our memories? What is our nostalgia? What are the things that makes us relate to each other? Uh, back in 2020, in the capstone of my undergraduate degree, I created a project called Project Oswald, which was a pre-COVID life time capsule recording people's daily lives. It was built to be a relic on purpose and was my first interaction with technology and techno nostalgia. In my master's degree, I got to touch on nostalgia, nature, and design across cultures. I touched on it briefly and it was fascinating, but I had to sideline it because of the compressed timeline of my master's degree. Now, why are you interested in nostalgia? Maybe because it has an ongoing impact in design and products. Maybe you're curious, design, memories, and innovation, you want to learn more. Or maybe you just think nostalgia is pretty cool and interesting. Either way, I'm glad you're here. So let's get started. Now, as we go through, there's going to be a QR code for the Slido, for the Slido at uh, each intersection. So feel free to scan it as I go along and submit your questions. At the beginning, let's talk about what is familiar. Nostalgia is a happy, sad, affectionate, and fond feeling. But across all definitions, it is longing towards the past. It's looking towards the past. The word origin comes from returning home and pain together. In fact, it actually used to be considered an illness. We'll touch on that later. Now I'm going to show you some images from my nostalgia. Each of these pictures bring about a warm and fuzzy and kind of sad feeling. Some of them are very particular and may mean nothing to you, but each one means a whole lot to me in a particular way. And here are some pictures that might be from your nostalgia. If I get this right, which it would be wild if I did, I just caused a gut-wrenching feeling in you, many people who I have never met, through just a few photos. Yeah, it kind of makes sense that nostalgia used to be considered an illness, a serious one at that. Imagine soldiers being bedridden, discharged, abandoning the front line because they saw something that reminded them of home, or they heard a song, or, in its origins, the sound of cowbells brought upon the illness. The fact is, nostalgia taps into a complex emotion that can cause physical reactions. So how does this relate to our creations? Okay. This is a chart by Han An Shui and Pedro Cavajo de Ameda, two researchers who released a paper called Nostalgia and its value to design strategy. It was published in 2011, and the paper explored how memory impacts design and vice versa, design impacts memory. 
This visual helps us see the different types of nostalgia that's out there. Now they added a layer of complexity to it and how we can see it from a strategic perspective. Things that are personal nostalgia and interpersonal nostalgia can it allow us to make personalized custom design features and experiences versus cultural and virtual nostalgia can be a more mass slash larger audience. When using big word nostalgia, it needs to be tooled in specific ways. Is it a personal experience for them? Is it a collective memory that you're tapping into? The nostalgia from your persona may differ from your audience, so use it wisely and carefully. Also, the paper is free and available, so if you would like to read it yourself, it's a pretty short read and I'm happy to share the link with you all. Let's see this in real life. Let's break it down. An individual or personal nostalgia for me would be my uncle's Timberland boots. When I was little, I used to try them on while he slept to practice being big like him. An interpersonal nostalgia would be him remembering the fact that the boots only went up to my knees, but I would still try. Cultural nostalgia with those same boots? I'm from New York City, home of the Timberland boots and the fitted cap on the dome piece. If you're from New York, you know what I'm talking about. Each, oop, there we go. There we go. <laughs> um, remember our diagram from earlier? The things that are personal and interpersonal for me and him would be a more so personalized design piece versus a larger reach. Some things that are meaningful for me as a New Yorker and to other New Yorkers might mean nothing to my uncle versus something that is culturally significant to us, I'm Ganyan, might not mean something to the vast majority of New Yorkers. Nostalgia is quite complex, even in a diagram like this. And then there's virtual nostalgia, which, well, we'll get into that now. Now, what I'm talking about is different from, well, wait a second. There we go. What I'm talking about is different from design trends. They're great, and we're going to touch into that. But Nostalgic UX is a bit different. There are design trends from 2005, and then there are visuals inspired by 1985. Both are valid to use, but hit on different notes. Ooh, there we go. There's my mouse. Uh, we can look at the cultural. We can look at the cultural nostalgia of a hairstyle or outfit versus the virtual nostalgia of someone seeing that outfit in a TV show or piece of media, growing up feeling nostalgic, and getting that feeling tapped into when you see somebody in real life wearing it, or hearing about the '80s from somebody versus seeing it online and longing for a different time altogether that you yourself never experienced hands-on. Now, what are some examples of these trends? Well, you have your Y2Ks, Vaporwave, and even Dreamcore. What am I talking about? Y2K, early 2000s glam. Pretty much every live-action tween media from that time period falls under Y2K. Vaporwave. Your 1980s meets 1580s in art, but electronic in music. Dreamcore, which is liminal spaces and nostalgia. Yes, 2020s haunting and comforting aesthetics that is surreal yet familiar. It's actively trying to find home in a strange time where time feels so unreal. Do, 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 do. There we go. A pattern that I found in virtual nostalgia is third places. It's outside. In the past or in other places, going outside to the park, a yard, a hillside, being in a forest that seemed endless. It's making friends on Wii World, aim chats, and dancing to Hemtaro as the internet was the portal to the outside. The wide world web. It's longing for a world that is familiar in its own way, but equally as wondrous. However, there's another major factor at play. 
Design trends play into our memories, but fluctuate between optimism and pessimism of the present. Whichever trend or year you're reaching back into, the visual trend and the branding of the voice is determined by how we feel about our world now. With the proliferation of the internet, nostalgic aesthetics can be formed to any decade simultaneously. Optimism and pessimism can fluctuate day by day. It may be why we see in Gen Z and Alpha this fluctuation between it's so over and we're so back so rapidly. Creating futuristic designs is inevitably going to become an invention of its time. Creating designs that pay homage to the past will also become an invention of its time. Think about early 2000s Chrome and how that was kind of futuristic at its time. Most importantly, even when design trends play homage to the past, they're looking towards the future. Nostalgia itself remains in the past. It remains between our sadness and our happiness. It remains, it can remain just out of reach. Can. Okay, everybody, close your eyes. Imagine, if you can, a Windows interface. Okay, older. Okay, older. Older again? Maybe you've seen them, maybe you've used them, but you may know their sounds. Okay, you can open your eyes now. Nostalgic UX is creating experiences that we find familiarity in. It's home screens we can come home to, experiences we can come back to. It's why Vaporwave loves Windows 95, why Apple revisits its colorful era. The charm of its software failures that we see in 95 and the independence and creativity returning back to tech with personalized iMacs. I want to show you how nostalgia can make a culture of great designs. So, how can we do this? Nostalgic UX, at its core, makes us as creators choose a deeper empathy to diagnose solutions. This is new innovation with past accents. I remember being a high school senior when Samsung first revealed the first ever flexible screen. I went absolutely wild in my English classroom. Sorry if you're hearing this, I was totally doing the task at the time. We can have rollable phones now. What about even curved monitor screens? I can't wait for the future. And I was excited to see what new creative things we were going to do with futuristic technology like curved screens. And yet, here with foldables, we see a physical form factor that could so easily be marketed as a Y2K exploit. We recently learned about Y2K. But instead, the visuals and ads show how individualistic, independent, and creative folks who use this phone are. They're given creative freedom, the freedom to not hold their phone, to put it away. By using this dated form, we have opened up the door to new technology applications. We're given the, the opportunity to critique the norm. And even now, it continues. Like, two weeks ago now, as more companies are offering their own foldables, each leaning into a sleek and modern marketing. Lately, I've seen more designers point out how the slippery rectangle that is the flagship smartphone is flat out bad design. For those who attended design school, imagine submitting a glass $1,200 piece of technology meant to be carried every day, presenting it as universal and the norm because it's been done before with the expectation that everyday folks will buy a separate set of tools or protective material to protect your creation from everyday use, or even possible augmentation to the individual to make it usable. People are longing for a holdable piece of technology 
and it led to foldable pieces of technology. And finding that meant accepting that maybe an older form was better for that new tech. In physical creations, nostalgic UX allows us to collaborate with the past and bring the future, looking back at forms we remember while innovating with new technology. On to case number two, believable assistance. The cool new AI we're developing, yeah, I can use some help. Nostalgic UX asks, what does a helpful, trusted assistant look like? It understands that we may not prevent errors, then asks what errors are forgivable. It play That plays into trust and an expectation of how helpful the assistant will be. Examples? Clippy, the hated and terrifying paperclip whose invasive and unhelpful nature uh, made him memorable for all the wrong reasons. Clippy was made to help transition folks to the new graphical interface of Windows, but made everyday Windows users aware of their settings and the lack of control they had on their devices. Versus a goose. Yes, this is a video game reference. Desktop Goose is a fan-made borderline virus built to bring mayhem to your user interface, but it has a loving fan base. A brief demo for you. There we go. If you hear music quietly, don't worry about it. It comes with the video. <laughs> now how does this come back to making better ai the fact is people willingly install this app it reminds them of pets pets that they've had in the past and virtual pets back into that virtual nostalgia desktop goose brings out old photos that has helped elderly users with loneliness and some are even worried about their goose getting lonely AI may advance from a technological perspective, but we have to think about what the people using technology are truly longing for and what's going to bring them joy when they're using our devices. How can we better service and support them with this new technology? Lastly, we have new natural interfaces, or NUI. Uh, we can use nostalgic UX to create friendly technology in natural environments. Think of neutral colored fabrics and tech and wood textures on technology, minimal screens and touch interfaces with soft sounds. Amber Case, fellow cyborg anthropologist, calls this calm technology. This is a call to nature, a longing for outside. New knee can make complex digital systems easier to use and onboard while bringing the outside inside. The natural environments also eases digital fatigue. So for those who are overburdened by it, but still need assistive devices at home, it allows for that to be an easier process for them. Oop, there we go. There we go. Uh, I expand upon this more in a separate presentation called Nostalgic. I hone in on craft, creation, uh, on craft, creation, connection to our objects, and the Internet of Things, IoT. But for the purposes of this presentation today, nostalgia for intentionality in our interactions creates calmer person-to-technology interaction and eases the burden of technology use in everyday life. While preparing this presentation, I got feedback from a fellow researcher. Nostalgia is a critique of the present. It died in the past for a reason. Nostalgia helps us critique the present. However, just because a design died in the past does not mean it holds no truths today. 
The reality is, technology is progressing so fast that the expectation now is regular onboarding built on infinite neuroplasticity. It's not very sustainable. In short, how can someone find familiarity in their technology when home is constantly changing and they keep putting the kitchen towels in the bathroom? It makes sense that there are some tools and platforms some folks do not participate in or prolong updating. And it's harmful that those who are feeling this friction are left out by us. So let's think about what are they longing for? All right, I gave you a bunch of information to break down and reflect upon. How can you use this? What can we do with it? First, remember to identify the type of nostalgia that we are using. Think back to the chart that we had earlier on. Next, think about what is familiar for them, the people that you are designing, developing, or creating for. Lastly, what is your audience longing for? And try to put those things together. Big word nostalgia is quite powerful, but we can use it in a lot of different ways. Okay, home stretch. Nostalgic UX asks us as creators to reach a new empathy with those using our devices. What are they longing for? Where are they coming from? How can we support their goals, their future? It also asks us as creators to reflect upon what makes great design. Now, nostalgic UX is cool and fascinating, and we can use it for good. However, we can also use it for not so good. There is a larger conversation we can have about nostalgic UX, manipulation, data mining via integrative digital systems, and more. I'm a researcher, what can I say? But the goal today was to spark your interest in the topic and give you something that you can use tomorrow. And I think I achieved that today. Thank you all so much for listening. Uh, I'm excited to chat more with you all. And I am ready for your questions. All right. Let's see.